Okay, next we have inferolateral. And inferolateral means below and to the outside. So it's below a certain area and to the outside. Inferior medial means below and toward the midline of the body. Superlateral means above a certain reference point to the outside. And superior medial means above a certain reference point toward the midline. Next is caudal. We talked about this before. It's below in relationship to another structure. So if it's below, it's like the elbow joint would be caudal to the shoulder joint. If it's cephalic, it's above in relationship to another structure, higher or superior. So the shoulder joint would be cephalic or higher than the elbow joint. Deep means beneath or below the surface, used to describe relative depth or location of muscles or tissue. So if we look at my forearm, this would be superficial, but everything underneath the surface of the skin would be considered deep to the, the surface of the skin. Which is our next one, it means superficial, it means near the surface, used to describe relative depth or location of muscle or tissue. So the muscles will be deep to the the skin, which is superficial to the muscles. Now, distal, situated away from the center or midline of the body, away from the point of origin. So the elbow joint would be distal to the shoulder joint. Proximal would be nearest to the trunk or the point of origin. So the shoulder joint is proximal to the elbow joint because it's more toward the trunk or the point of origin. Lateral, always to the outside, farther from the medial, medium or mid-sagittal plane. Medial, relating to the middle or center, near to the midline or mid-sagittal plane. Medium relating to the middle or center, it's almost like medial. The two go hand in hand, toward the midline. Prone, the body lying face down or lying on your stomach. Supine, lying on your back with, the, with your, your ventral part, your anterior part laying, be facing upward, be lying on your back. Dorsal, related, it's all related to the back, kind of like a dorsal fin on a, on a fish or a shark or a dolphin or something. Ventral, always relating to the belly or abdomen or toward the front. Palmar, relating to the palm aspect of the hand. Planter, relating to the sole or under surface of the foot. So if you look at the foot, so if we have like plantar flexion, our toes would point downward because the bottom of the foot can, is considered the plantar part of that. Now we're going to talk about alignment variation terminology. And we want this because we have this picture here as if you look at the normal curvature of the spine. If we look at that, that's a line, it's a, we're aligned properly. You know, when the shoulders aren't like this, everything's aligned, they're e equal. If we look at the spine from the side, it's in its normal curve, but as we fo fold forward a little bit, get more kyphotic, that would be out of alignment. So we're gonna talk about th those kind of terms that go hand in hand with that. First, look at the anti-version. This is abnormal or excessive rotation forward of a structure such as femoral antiversion, like the knees are pointing in. So what's happening here is the, the, uh, the, the head of the, uh, the femur, it's actually rolled forward. It's actually turned inward. So what happens when you take that whole structure, that whole system, 
and you rotate the hip forward, the knees are going to point in too. So that's what they call antiversion. Retroversion is the abnormal excessive rotation backward of a structure, such as toes pointing out. So this is, if the hip, hip's rotated in, that's antiversion. If it's rotated outward, that's called retroversion. We're going to get a toes pointed out. Also, too, if we look at the spine, we look at the vertebral column. If we have each vertebra is is pointed, it's at a certain angle. Now, if it's tilted too far forward, that's called antiversion, kind of like the pelt, kind of like the hip. If it's rotated forward, if um, vertebra is tilted forward, it's antiversion. If it's tilted backward, then that's called retroversion. So the two go hand in hand. Kyphosis, increased curvature of the spine outward or backward in the sagittal plane. So if we look at the sagittal plane, it cuts the body into equal left and right halves. If we look at the spine, if we have a normal lordotic curve, as in the picture, we have normal. But if we have out backward uh, or outward pushing back of the, of the middle of the back, the upper back, that's called kyphosis. Lower doses basically is anterior tilt of the pelvis. So if we have a normal a neutral pelvis and a normal curvature of the spine, if we get an anterior tilt of the pelvis, we'll get an inward or forward rotation of the pelvis in the sagittal plane. Now scoliosis, it's a lateral curving of the spine. So if you look at my bag, if, I'm the, if you look at the, the V, if you look at the vertebral column, it should be in a straight line, as in here. If you look at that, all the spinous processes will be lined up accordingly in a straight line. But if there's any kind of uh, curvature of the spine to the, to the side or lateral, that's called scoliosis. Next, we have recurvatum. And what that is, is the bending backward in knee hyperextension. Think about that. Your knee's lined up normally, but the, the knee's actually pointing backwards. That is hyperextension. Next is valgus. We, now, we must figure, where's the key word here? And that's distal. It's the outward angulation of the distal segment of a bone or joint, as in knocked knees. So if we have knocked knees, it's the distal segment of the bone or joint. So the distal part of the bone, which would be the top of the femur. If you look at that, it's the outward angulation. So the, so the, so the lower leg is actually angled out at the bottom of the joint. Distal segment of the joint, so it's angled outward. That's going to cause the knees to come in. On the other side, we're going to have varus. The inward angulation of the distal segment of the bone or joint, as in bow legs. So if we look at bow legs here, the distal part of the joint is actually pointing outward. So that's the difference between the two, inward and outward. Next are body regions. So if you notice here, there are numerous regions of the body that we need to specifically focus on. So that's what we're going to do next. Now the major body regions, first one is the axial. That's the head the neck and the trunk, with the appendicular being the upper limbs and the lower limbs. So let's break that down even, more, even farther. Let's start with the axial. We have the cephalic or the head, which is the cranium and the face. We have the cervical, which is the neck region, and the trunk, which is the vertebral column. We also have the, the cervical, the thoracic, the dorsal, which is the back, the abdominal region, and it's also the pelvic or pelvis region. So that's, that's the axial. The appendicular would be the upper limbs, which would be the, the shoulder, the arm, the forearm, manual, or the hand. 
Then we have the lower limbs, which would be the thigh, the leg. Now the whole thing is what they call a leg, but here's what we have, the thigh and the leg. And then we have the pedal, which would be the foot. Next we got, let's look at the whole skeletal system as a whole. So we're going to talk about osteology, which is the study of bone. We're going to have all the functions of the bone and the types of bones. So you can see from this picture and looking at our skeleton here, Mr. Bones, there are many, many bones. And they're all put, they're all shaped differently. They're all put together differently at different joints. Each joint has a different uh, function, different range of motion, all that. So if we know how this is all put together, which is our foundation, we can, we can start to analyze movement much more efficiently and effectively. Now, osteology, the study of bone, if we look at the delt skeleton, we're going to study that. It's 206 bones. The axial skeleton, remember the head, cranium and face, cervical, the vertebral column, the thoracic, lumbar, and the pelvic regions. There's 80 bones there. And the appendicular, Basically, the arms and the legs, which have 126 bones. They have occasional variations, but for the most part, we're just going to stick with what we just, what we just uh, reviewed. Now, what are they? Skeletal functions. The protection of the heart, lungs, and brain. So support to maintain posture. That's important because if, if, it, if you weren't being held up, and all the joint, the bones put together by ligaments, the joints, and the muscles held them up, you know, that were activated by the nerve system, we would collapse. So we still, it helps to maintain posture because we need that solid foundation to be able to make human movement. We have moved by serving as points of attachments for the muscles and acting as levers. That's what the bones are for. If you look at it, if you've got like the, the pec muscle, will come over here and attach to the arm. Those are points of attachments for the muscles to be able to cause movement. When the muscle contracts, it will cause movement of the arm in many different planes, many different aspects, or many different angles in, in the planes of motion. It's also for mineral storage, this is calcium and phosphorus. And it's hemopoiesis. In vertebral bodies, especially in the spine, femurs, humerus, ribs, and the sternum. This is where the process of blood formation is in the red bone marrow. The bone marrow is in the, in the medullary cavity of these long bones. That's where red, red blood cells are formed. Next, we have the types of bones. What are the types of the bones? Well, we have long bones, as in the humerus in the humerus and the fibula here we also have the femur so you can see all these in the in the thigh in the lower leg and in the forearm are all long bones next we have short bones which are the carpals which are in the hand, and the tarsals, which were in the, in, the, in the feet. Flat bones, which we have in the skull, and also, too, in the scapula. So if you look at that, the shoulder blade, it's, an, it's a flat bone. And we have the irregular bones, which are the pelvis, which we have here, and inside the ear, the three bones inside the ear, consider irregular. Another irregular bone would be the vertebra, too. So if you look at that, with all the processes that come out, the round cylindrical part where the spinal cord goes through, and also, too, with all these other processes and fat facets, it's an irregular bone. And the next, we have the sesamoid bone, which is which is the patella, which is the kneecap. Now, let's look at long bones. It's 
It's composed of a long cylindrical shaft with relatively wide protruding ends. So if we look at the, at the femur here, long cylindrical part, but long protruding wide ends on the proximal and distal part of this bone. The shaft contains the medullary, medullary canal. And examples are, once again, the femur. We have the radius, the ulna. We have the fibula, the tibia and fibula. We also have the metatarsals and metacarpals. Now short bones, small cubical, solid shaped bones that usually have a proportionally larger articulating surface in order to articulate with more than one bone. So if we, if we look at the carpals of the hand, you can see small cubical shaped bones and the, and, the, and the ends of the bones will articulate with other bones within the hand itself too. Once again, carpals and the tarsals, the hands and the feet. Now flat bones usually have a curved surface and vary from thick to thin in here where tendons attached to be to very thin. Now we have the ilium, which is in the pelvis. We have the ribs. We have the sternum, the clavicle, and the scapula. If we look at the borders of these particular bones, muscles attached to these in order to make it rotate upward, go up and down, pull together, and rotate upward and downward. Irregular bones, these include the bones throughout the entire spine and ischium, which is the pelvis. It's in the pubis as well too, where the two parts, two parts of the pelvis come together. And the maxilla, maxilla, which is your jaw bone. Sesmoid bones, they're small bones like the patella, embedded within the tendon of a muscular tendinous unit that provides protection and improved mechanical advantage of a muscular uh, tendinous unit. If we look at where the uh, rectus femoris comes over and, and crosses the knee joint. Now, the patella actually will add a mechanical advantage because it increases the moment arm within this knee joint because if the moment arm is bigger, it will cause more force production and change the angle of insertion of where the rectus femoris is inserting on, onto the lower leg. Next we have bone, what are the bone features? Typical bony features, we have diaphysis, it's a long cylindrical shaft. The cortex, which is the outer part, hard, dense, compact bone forming the walls of the diaphysis. That's the outside. The periosteum, which is a dense fibrous membrane covering the outer surface of the diaphysis. So kind of, kind of call it like bone skin, you could call it that. The endosteum, the fibrous membrane that lies inside of the cortex. So if we look over here, if we split this and looked at the inside, it would be on the inside, on the inside of the medullary cavity. Now the medullary or marrow cavities between the walls of the diaphysis Here's the walls of the diaphysis, and inside is the medullary cavity. It's between the walls of the diaphysis containing yellow or fatty marrow. That's where red blood cells are produced. Now, typical bony features, if you look at this, the epiphysis is the ends of the long bones formed from cancellous or spongy or trabecular bone. The epiphyseal plate it's within, this a th thin cartilage plate that separates the diaphysis from the epiphysis.
the articulating or hyaline cartilage that covers the epiphysis on this side, in this side, and here to provide cushioning and effect to reduce friction. So that's the articulating surfaces between different bones. Next we have properties of bone and bone markings. Um, these bone properties compose of calcium carbonate, calcium phosphate, collagen, and water. That's what, uh, that's what the bone is made out of. 60 to 70 percent of bone weight is the calcium carbonate and calcium phosphate. The other 25 to 30 percent of bone weight is water. Collagen provides some flexibility and strength in resisting tension. So an example is that within that is collagen. So if we compress this bone or twist it a little bit or bend it, that provides, gives a little bit of give in there, but it also provides a substantial amount of strength in bones to make sure that it becomes a very, very rigid structure. Now aging causes progressive loss of this collagen and increases brittleness. That's why throughout the life they tell you to keep exercising because if we can load these bones, whether they're long bones, short bones, irregular bones, it doesn't matter. If we can, if we can add a tense up, tension to these bones, it will keep producing new bone cells, lay them down and make the bone thicker and stronger. Whether it's compression forces like that or a muscle pulling on the bone or twisting it, it will lay down new, new uh, bone cells and they will calcify and become stronger and stronger. Most of the outer bone is cortical with cancellus underneath. Outside is cortical, underneath is cancellus bone. Cortical bone, low porosity, 5 to 30% normal mineral, uh, uh, non mineralized tissue. The cancellus and spongy bone toward the end of the bone is high porosity, 30 to 90%. That's what they call trabecular bone as well. Cancellus bone, compact or trabecular or spongy bone. Cortical bone is stiffer and can withstand greater stress, but less strain than cancellus. Cancellus is spongier, but can undergo greater strain before fracturing. So there's a big difference between there. Bone size and shape can be influenced by the direction and magnitude of the forces that are habitually applied to them. Bones reshape themselves based on the stresses placed on them. That's what we just talked about. So if we look at whether it's the femur, which is this, if you look at it, we're walking, we're loading the bone. The, the, uh, the forces of gravity or a weight in our back, like doing a squat. If we can load that bone a certain way, it'll stress it enough where it's gonna lay down new bone cells. They will calcify and become stronger and stronger and stronger. That's where the bone reshapes themselves based on what kind of stress that you put on them. Bone mass increases over time with increased stress. So once again, you know, exercise is considered a stress, but it has to be the right type of stress, the right amount of stress to be, enable these bones, this connective tissue to grow and, be, and become stronger and stay strong. Next we have bone markings. So let's look at these. They are processes, including any kind of elevation or projections. They're processes that form joints. Remember that. Processes that form joints. And this could be a condyle. So if we look at the femur, we have the condyles for the knee, a facet. Remember the projections? They have a superior and inferior facets and they form with the ones of the vertebra above and below and these form little joints. And the next is the head of the femur or it could be the humeral head or whatever, but they form joints. These three particular processes form joints. Now, additional bone markings that we have. 
They are additional processes, elevations, or projections. And these processes is where the ligaments, muscles, or tendons will attach to. First one is the crest. So if we look at the ilium, the ili iliac crest, that's where muscles, tendons, or ligaments will attach to. The next one is the epicondyle. So if we look at the humerus, here's are the epicondyles right in there. That's where muscles, tendons, or ligaments will attach to. A line. If we look at the femur, if we go to the posterior side, the linear Linea aspera of the femur is where a lot of the muscles will attach to. Process, where the xiphoid process, at the end of the xiphoid, you know, we have the sternum, and the end bone there is the, is the xiphoid, where we have muscles attached to as well. Then we have a spine, which is another process, like the, the spine of the scapula, where muscles attach to. The sutures of the skull, if we look at it, it looks, actually looks like a suture from, from a surgery. But that's where um, ligaments, muscles, or tendons will attach to as well. The trochanter, we have the femur, we have the greater and lesser trochanters, but that's where we have attachments as well too. Next we have a tubercle. of the tubercles of the humerus. Once again, we have the head where it forms the joint, which is a process, but we also have tubercles where muscles will attach at as well. Then we have the t uh, tuberosity, which is a raised portion, and at the tibial tuberosity is where the rectus femoris will attach to from the, one of the quad muscles will cross the knee joint, where it crosses over the patella and attach right down in here on the, the tibia, which is called the tibial tuberosity. More bone markings, they were called, they're called cavities or depressions. These include any kind of openings or grooves. We have the facet, we talked about those. The facets, the uh, superior and inferior facets, they are openings or little grooves that form joints. We have the foramen. So if you look at the pelvis here, the foramen, which would be the opening right in here. So if you look at that, the foramen is a large opening right there in the pelvis. We also have the uh, fossa of the pelvis in the lower part, which is another opening right in here. The fovea, which is a groove in the femoral head, right in here. So if you look at the femur, inside there, if you take a look at the femoral head, there's a little groove in there. The metis, or if you look at the ear canal, if you look here on the side, right in here, if you take off the ear and look at the bone, it's an ear canal. That's what they call a metis. The sinus, again, look at the opening. It's opening or groove. This is an opening. The sinus is where the nose would be. And a sulcus. Let's look here. The sulcus of is a groove of the humerus. The intertubecular sulcus is where the um, pec would, would attach to. And also, too, where the lats, as they wrap around, will attach just um, posterior to where the pectoralis major attaches to. Now let's look at the classifications of joints. All a joint is is an articulation. It's a connection of bones at a joint, usually to allow movement between two, two particular surfaces of bones. So if you look here, we have the uh, scapula and maybe the humeral head. This is an articulation. It's just a joint. 
cause movement between two surfaces of bones. We have three major classifications according to structure and movement characteristics, depending on the type of bone and how they're supposed to move. We have synarthroidal, ampiarthroidal, and we have diarthroidal. Uh, in your book, we have functional classifications, the different types of joints, what we just mentioned, and the structural classifications. And we'll go through each and every one of these. But this is a nice little graph or chart in your book that you can go and reference. Let's look at the first one, immovable joints. They have sutures, such as the skull sutures. They are immovable. These are thin arthroidal. They're immovable. An example is the sutures of the skull and the gomophus, which are the teeth. Ampiarthroidal, they're slightly movable joints, allow a slight, a slight amount of motion to occur. Then we have the syndesmosis, symphysis, and synchondrosis. So let's take a look at those. The syndesmosis, two bones, two bones joined together by a strong ligament or interosseous membrane within that allow minimum movement between the bones. Bones may or may not touch each other at the actual joint. Now, if we look at this, an example is a coroclavicular joint or distal fibular joint. If we look here, the coroclavicular joint right in here, by the clavicle and the coracoid process of the scapula. That is a slightly move, that's syndesmosis, slightly movable. If we also look at the tibia and fibula, this is a syndesmosis joint. Slight movement, but not a lot. They don't touch each other, but they move slightly. Ampiarthroidal, Again, let's look at a symphysis. Joint separated a fibrocartilage pad that allows, very, that allows very slight movement between the bones. An example of that is, is the pelvic region, the pubis. There's a, bit of, there's a thick cartilage in there, but joins the two sides of the pelvis, the, the pelvis together, and it has caused a slight movement there. Also, too, again, if we look at the intervertebral disc or the vertebral column, if you look at the disc, in between each disc is, uh, is cartilage. And it allows the cushion there, but it allows just slight movement of the vertebral column. So it, go, it flexes, it flexes, extends, rotates slightly, and flexes side to side. The last one here is synchondrosis. Type of joint separated by hyaline cartilage that allow very slight movement between the bones. This is in between the ribs, the costochondral joints of the ribs within the sternum. Slight movement there. So when we breathe, breathe in and breathe out, there's slight movement there because that has to cause a little bit of motion so the lungs can expand and then they expand and then uh, they uh, breathe out the air, then they, they contract again. 